City Council Committee of the Whole meeting to order Monday, February the 10th, 2020, approximately 5.03 p.m. Uh, the first thing is on our agenda is Amarok Building Reuse Project. So we're going to ask uh, Natasha Hampton to do that. Building Reuse Program, specifically the application um, for support of the Amarok Building Reuse Project. Just a little bit about um, Amarok. They are the world's largest producer of corrosion-proof polymer concrete structures. Uh, the poly polymer concrete structures replaces lime-type cements as a binder, and they're often used for sewer structures, swimming pools, um, and drainage channels. Currently, um, Amarok produces, um, the, the products that they're producing are currently sold in North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, Virginia, and Florida, and they're, they're manufactured currently out of Sulphur Springs, Texas, and they're shipped from there. So uh, Amarok recognized the need to have an East Coast-based operation, and thus they chose um, which the city of Rocky Mountain and the limits to purchase a building at 133 Blue Hawaiian Drive. This is an aerial of the building here on North, between North Wesleyan and Fort Park Drive. So in this facility, they are looking to do building modifications that are needed to supply sufficient workspace. Um, they're looking to also modify and improve the HVAC um, structures there as well as electrical improvements. The anticipated cost for these modifications and improvements will be a $2.3 million investment and approximately 41 new full-time positions are um, expected according to the grant application. There is a match requirement if the council so chooses to support this application. Um, the grant is 5% of the total grant amount. The grant amount is $300,000, so that equates to $15,000. But that's a cost share match that will be shared between the Carolina Gateway Partnership and the City of Rocky Mount. And in this case, the grant match for the city um, is $7,500. And funding has been um, identified and is made available utilizing the economic development account and the numbers listed here. Um, what is being asked um, from the council this evening is um, for council to um, provide the city manager with authorization to place this item on the February 24th um, council agenda for council to um, approve um, the thank you for um, uh, council to approve the resolution. Um, on the 24th, and also to authorize the city manager to execute the grant agreement um, once those agreements have been received. So tonight um, is just for your information, but the item will come back forth for the council to um, authorize your support of this application. Are there any questions of the council members? Uh, the 41 jobs, you know, at the, the, the bottom, it talks about um, the five criteria that have to be met. 
if they're not met, the city's ultimately responsible. So we're going to then pass that along to the company. So if they don't meet the 41 jobs, this pro rata would come back to the city, but we're going to pass that along to the company. Yes, the, there is a um, deed, um, a trust that the city takes out on the um, account holder in mm -hmm. order to ensure the, the funds for uh, what the city puts in as a required match. And then on uh, follow up, previous on some of the other grants with the uh, frozen food and then the Babington, um, I noticed that the mayor was signing. Why is there a reason we're changing to the city manager this time? It's, it's, it's either or it was the council's pleasure um, for the mayor to sign previously. Um, and so the um, in order to ensure that the applications are um, timely and executed timely, um, we ask that the council consider the city manager. However, the council has been at the council's pleasure previously. Is it either or? Yeah. I'm thinking those other grants require the highest elected official to sign. The last one the manager was allowed to sign. Okay. It did. I don't know. Well, I, don't know the, I don't know the magic behind it, but sometimes I'm authorized to do that by the grant application. Sometimes well, the grant, it's, it's the, the grant. last grant I was saying we've had so the highest signed by the highest elected official. Yeah, but I, I have that since you have it. Mm -hmm. they've, they've since I've been okay. here, it fluctuates. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the grant application and what the grant requires. So I don't seek to execute these things unless it specifies the city manager. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's the same grant as the previous city manager. No, what I'm saying is. Oftentimes, sometimes it's the it depends on the grant, sometimes it's the, the mayor. So whatever the grant is requiring, that's what, what we do. And this grant requiring the city manager, is that correct? Well, I guess that's, that's what she said. It's either or. Okay. Any other questions? Staff would like to add any additional information? No, sir, other than um, as the assistant city manager stated, we will, um, with your consent, place this on the February 24th agenda for formal approval. We always have to see economic development and more jobs here in our city. And so we're going to receive this as information. And um, it will be placed on the city council then on the 24th. Yes, sir. We will receive uh, approval, hopefully, from the city council. Okay. Item number two, the second quarter of fiscal year 2020 report of revenues and expenditures. Uh, Kenneth Hunter. Kind of, uh, kind of unique in the fact that we just presented the first quarter report last month and we are already in a position to be able to present the second quarter report. Uh, so we will take a chance to take a look at where we are with respect to revenues and expenditures. The good news is the trends that we saw in December are continuing for, uh, that we saw at the end of the first quarter continuing in the second quarter. We'll also take a look at the monthly employment update for the month of November. There were two items that uh, council during our last meeting last month had asked about, which was some zip code employment analysis as well as wages by employment sector here locally. And we also wanted to share that information with you as well. Uh, in terms of where we are for the second quarter, we continue to see strong growth with our ad valorem uh, in revenues as well as our sales tax revenues. Overall, our revenue picture is very good with respect to the general fund. And uh, the activity, again, we want to say that this year, we also are tracking the activities of the event center with respect to uh, revenues and expenditures. Overall, our expenditures are less than they were last year uh, at the end of January compared to January of 20, uh, of fiscal year 2019. Um, and that's in, in a couple of different areas. And at this point, based on what we're seeing, we are not anticipating needing to use the $1.5 million in appropriated fund balance in order to balance this year's budget. So uh, that money should be able to be returned to fund balance instead of being, being used as appropriate in the budget. We, we appear to be on the track for that. With respect to our utilities, uh, which constitute about 70% of our total budget on the electric and gas side, uh, the good news on the electric side is that sales have been consistent with respect to electrical usage. We actually have seen some growth 
in electric uses, and we can tie that to some increase of in industrial activity, as well as increased residential activity with additional residents moving into the area. We also have noticed a little bit of a lag in gas, and of course that is due to weather. Gas is a weather-dependent utility, primarily because it is used for heating. The good news with respect to the gas side is that even though we've seen that lag in gas sales, we also seen a lag in gas purchases. And generally speaking, gas has been very cheap. So overall, we've been able to maintain our operating margins in both utilities. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the good sign, even though, uh, and that's because of the way the rate structure is designed. And expenditures are on target in both funds. On the water and sewer side, this year, we are seeing that water sales have picked up a little bit, and we should meet our targeted revenue projections with water for the current fiscal year. On the other hand, sewer sales have been down, and that's predominantly due to the dry weather. Now, that will, of course, may change a little bit with what's happened here very recently, but we have not had the same uh, sales to our wholesale customers due to influent infiltration in other systems that typically end up getting charged and, as a rev and ends up being revenue for us. Of course, we also have to treat it. And so even though revenues are down, treatment costs are also down, both in the, in the sewer area. And um, we, of course, did anticipate significant capital activity on the expense side, but as you saw during the uh, financials presentation a couple of months ago, our financials are in good shape. We anticipated these capital expenses that we were going to be paying this current fiscal year, and so we are in good shape both in the water and sewer fund. We are also in good shape in the stormwater fund this year. Talk a little bit with respect to employment. Uh, we have had uh, three consistent, as of, as of the end of September, I'm sorry, the end of November, we've had in the city three consistent months of growth in employment. That's represented in the bars in yellow compared to bars in blue, which is labor force. Labor force has also grown. And that's kind of kept employment rates, the unemployment rate consistent because there's been growth in both areas. The same is also true for the metropolitan area. Uh, I know the December numbers came out last week for our local area. I haven't had a chance to, to necessarily look at those. But generally speaking, trends remain optimistic here locally. With respect to that, uh, what we can say is that as of November, if you looked at year-to-date change, for our metropolitan area compared to other metropolitan areas, we'd be around the middle at about 2.4% growth in our metropolitan area in employment as of year to date in November. So uh, we've had a good year overall for employment in the Rocky Mountain metropolitan area for this current year, I mean for, for 2019, and we hope to continue that in 2020. Now we'll talk a little bit also about the non-farm employment. This just kind of gives you an idea of the distribution of employment across the uh, metropolitan area. We only have this information on a metro basis. We don't have this information available at the city, but at the city level. As you can see, in terms of non-farm employment, we have just over 57,000 jobs. Uh, a significant share, more than 80% are in government, uh, uh, sorry, in the private sector. And about, about 44,500 are in the service industry, about 12,700 in goods production, of which 10,100 are in manufacturing. <coughs> So our manufacturing count is significant. It was really interesting to learn uh, Thursday during the chamber annual meeting about how, with example, Cummins, Cummins uh, facility, I think, represented 5% of their total global sales. If I was correct, about 5% of Cummins' total sales comes from their production here in the Rocky Mountain area, which is significant for a global company the size and scale of Cummins' operation. Talk about employment data by zip code. There are four zip codes that are located within the city of Rocky Mount, or there are significant parts of the city of Rocky Mount. 27801 and 27803 are towards the east and central. 27804 is towards the west. And 27809 is towards the north of the Battleboro area. So that just to kind of give you a frame of reference to where they are. These are the respective populations of work er worker age population, i.e. those that are between the ages of 20 and 64. And that's kind of how the census, when they're doing their annual updates to the American Community Survey, kind of sets the group that they consider as, as really targeted for the labor, labor analysis. As you can see, participation rates do vary. Overall, for the city, we're around 75%. Uh, some have higher participation rates, others are a little lower. Uh, with respect to employment to population ratio, within these, census, within these zip codes, we're around 69%. The unemployment rate overall, and this is as of the end of 2018, so it is a little dated. At that time, it was around 7.9%. And you can see, particularly to the north and to the east, that we do have above average unemployment compared to where we are in the center and west. And the same is also true with respect to male and female. Uh, it was really interesting, and it's also important to note as well, that male unemployment is higher than female unemployment here in the Rocky Mountain area. 
Um, no. Yes. Um, Mr. Hunter, on the unemployment rate, I know it's on zip code, but as you mentioned earlier, the um, state came out with their stuff last week, which I think we're at 4.3. So is that is for the MSA, is that a, that big of a difference between our zip codes and the MSA? Well, the difference is is that 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 uh, the challenge with looking at the unemployment rate is that the unemployment rate's done by month based on their surveys. These are based on a different survey that's done by the Census Bureau. So they may be calculating different groups. So the one thing I would probably say, I mean, this is a, maybe a good overall indicator of long-term employment or long-term unemployment. It is not as much an indication of where unemployment is at this moment. That would be the survey that would come out uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that came down last week. So we're better than, <laughs> that's what I'm getting to. Yeah. Hopefully we're, we're better off than what's in the data. The goal would be, yes, that we're better. This is, what this does is it gives us an idea of the differentiation between areas. There is information here because it does show variances between between particular locations. Right. So I see the source says 2014 and 2018. Yes. And I assume the last reported period is either late 2017 or sometime in 2018. Right. The way, the way the American Community Survey works is it kind of does like five-year estimates of a five-year grouping and it updates that, updates that annually. Like the last group was 2013, 2017. This is 2014 to 2018. Okay. So is this average over a five-year period? Close to an average over a five-year period. Can you also obtain the education level for achievement that would correlate with these different groups? We can, yes. I think we have that information. I don't have it off the top of my head. Oh, I know. I wouldn't expect it. And the other thing you can look at is we ask, you know, ask for uh, what is the differentiation in the services that each one of these areas have gotten around home ownership and equity and access. You know that we we want to look at that those those areas. Sometimes those numbers could represent <clears throat> not having access, not having equity, and, and you know you get those numbers. So we were trying to look at you know we know the numbers will come out like that. We want to be clear why those numbers are like that. What's driving? Correct. We can we can definitely do some work to look into other demographic factors with respect to that. The other thing that I will note as well is that zip code lines do not necessarily match up to municipal lines. Mm -hmm. That's another factor to consider. So there is some unincorporated territory included in these tracts as well. Okay. Now, so, so, so if we're understanding you um, correctly, Councilman John, what, what um, the Councilman I think is asking for are other factors by the yeah. zip code. Mm -hmm. For home ownership, home ownership, educational um, attainment, um, those other variables that might be in that community service. And access to service, you know, when I talk about service, access to to wealth building, access to to services from both state or federal, you know, uh, grocery stores. Uh, different thing that, that those communities don't have. Yeah, well, you're ultimately looking for what is it that's causing this, and how can we yeah. improve the lot of those yeah. in this position, right? That's so really what we want. Is yes, there anything that falls in that category? Right, so we keep apples to apples. We probably need to look at what that survey is reporting back. Right, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing but, yeah. and that was my, I want to sort of go back to what uh, Councilman Rogers was saying, too. Um, how do we align the data so that you really are looking in the same time mm -hmm. periods so that we don't have a skewed perspective yeah. unless there's some variance that can be applied with generic? I'll have, I'll have to look at it. The challenge is, is that really the, is that data is that the only data really that's collected at the local level that's tracked on a more current basis that's not you know built in a survey model or anything like that is the unemployment data and that's because the employment unemployment data is because the bureau of labor statistics does two different surveys and they do it on a local basis and so we'll have to work with that to see because the challenge is is that a lot of other data sets like the ones that we use to collect this information which provides us a broader understanding of employment by zip code or allows us to look at other other elements of employment is is not updated on as frequent a basis. Sure. So with, if, if we're looking at 
perhaps creating a, a broader lens mm -hmm. to help us understand who we are, we might want to consider broadening our perspective about how to evaluate. And there might be other data pools and other evaluation methods or methodologies, you know, that perhaps traditional um, economic development um, professionals might not currently employ. So I think the questions that uh, Councilman Joyner is are asking, I don't see it being easy to do, you no, know, no. but you know, you gotta bring in if you're talking about social determinants of health, yeah. that's a very wide range. Mm -hmm. right. Of factors and variables in different areas that um, measure data in different manners and forms, mm -hmm. which might not be easy for economists to mm -hmm. necessarily do. But if we want to look at a broader picture, that's probably working best. Not an easy task, but if we do it, we might be leading the pack. Right. And I would propose that you know we don't have to overcomplicate it either. Let's right. find the low hanging fruit right. and see if we can move the needle in the right direction. Right. 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 Because there are there are lots of folks who are doing that. It's just that they're not put together, so you can see it side by side by side. Yeah. But you know, it should not be impossible. Sure, we can we can certainly look and see what what is out there and figure out figure out a way to gather as much information right. as possible. This may be really considered far afield, but when my grandchildren were born, I was happened to be in the delivery room, and when the nurse was asking the mother of the child fill out the paperwork, she asked for the educational attainment of the mother. They didn't ask for the educational attainment for the father. So apparently there's considered that much difference in significance, effect on the child in terms of the educational attainment of the mother that may not be true with the father, but in, in terms of influencing the child and the life of the, that child will be brought up. But we don't capture anything like that in here, but it's considered important enough that when they do the information to the birth certificates, they do ask that. Mm -hmm. well, well, actually, the information that you provided had the education attainment, because I, mm -hmm. For the, the geek that I am, I put it in a spreadsheet. For, you know, I've got some of that compared right now, with, along with the disability and poverty mm -hmm. that he the provided. The attainment of each child, well, the now, mother beats them. That's what I'm doing. Well, not the mother, but this yeah, is well, that's, that's the point. This with the, the zip code. The influence on the okay. child of the educational team with the mother prior to that child's coming into the world. So uh, what clear direction do you want to give Mr. Hanna uh, to work on? <laughs> 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 bringing us Just keep bringing the type of information <laughs> we want. Yeah. Well, Social economic <laughs> opposed to... Well, I would dare say some people have done this before. Like, what does the UNC... Um, not the school guard, but the, um, the demographic. The demographic. Program. What have they done, or what do they have that we could just pull from and not put you to work? My experience with theirs, and there is some information, so I can definitely take a look. They're, they look at things a lot of times on a county basis. Uh, typically, what I've seen their reporting is done is on a county basis. And we're kind of going to a lower level than that. I'm not saying that that's the only thing that they do, but what I have typically seen is that the UNC demographic, Demographics Project does a lot of looking at kind of holistic statewide issues and they kind of get to get to um, get to that county level and they kind of compare like what one county is to another. Um, there are some groups out there that have started to really look at information and the way they look at it is on a census tract basis, which is a little smaller than a zip code. And because tip because what's happened is is that with this 2014-2018 ACS survey the Census Bureau actually made it to where they provided more of that detailed information available on a census <coughs> tract basis. They had kind of not been as good with that in the past. And of course, census tracts are also used for some other projects that they've looked at, like Opportunity Zone gathering. Well, well, they're also doing annual updates. So that, that's the key thing. Is it used to be only 10-year measurements. It used to only be 10-year measurements, and now they're doing more annual updates. So there is information out there. Um, and we can definitely, we can go as far into it as, 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 as possible and definitely show what's available. So once we get this information, I mean, what we're going to do with it, and what I'm saying to, this, to, the, to the council, um, because of what we're asking you to do uh, and to bring back with us is a show, as Councilman um, Joyner just stated in Blackwell, that those are in those zip codes for a certain sector 
in our community that are have lack of access to services, housing, so forth and so on, education. So that, that means that those are the areas that we're going to hope to target or will put investment in those communities. It's good to get the data, but once you get the data, what you're going to do with it? So, so you understand what you're asking me? I did, yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the next piece of information we wanted to provide was kind of giving an idea of local average wages by sector. And this takes a little bit of effort because what we want to do is try to control for irregularities due to hours of work. So what we've done is we've based it on the most current information available and we've annualized it as of the second quarter of 2019. Uh, these quarterly censuses of employment and wages typically run about six months behind. So we only have through the second quarter of 2019, and then we kind of looked back at the three previous quarters and kind of developed an annualized, an annualized level so that we could better understand it. And what we did find, these are the wages. The overall workforce average for our metropolitan, this is for the metropolitan area, is about $19.28 an hour. As you can see, there are several jurisdictions, there are several inter industries that, that, that pay above that in terms of hourly wages. There are a couple that don't. Um, so this is an overall perspective of, of where these wages are with respect to sector here in the Rocky Mountain metropolitan area. Any questions? Do you have any comparative data? Do these, do our wages track um, consistently with other regions or areas? In some areas they do what I would need, to, but that's easy to obtain is to pull the information for the other MSAs and do that. We can do that statewide or we can do that with us in neighboring states. Probably within the state and looking at neighboring would be the way to go with that. And I know we've been asked to look at a livable wage opposed to um, the current wages that we are paying our employees. But I know that's going to take money to get us to where we need to be. Well, I, I would, would also um, just remind the council that we do have a pay study uh, on the way. Uh, but we have done some preliminary work on uh, living wage. I think it's at $16 an hour. Correct. Well, 50, uh, it was, uh, it was, I think $16. Six, $16, $16 an hour is what we looked at. But of course, that was just the um, budget impact of the cost of raising wages to that. That did not address the compression that that would cause. So it's not a full cost just yet, but we do know what that cost would look like. So what we're doing basically is just waiting until our pay survey information comes back to us, of which of course will be um, shared with the council because you're going to have to give some direction about, um, you know, what is your pay philosophy uh, for the employee group. Do we want to be at market? Do we want to be slightly above the market, et cetera? So it is basically on study, and we've done some preliminary work to know exactly what just $16 an hour would be. So what is it currently? Um, the current uh, is about, what, 13 Yeah, the currently the base is, is in the range of um, the lowest in, The lowest of the range is 13 so in terms of if we even look at 16, that's, I think you don't want to mention a, a figure. Yeah, it's about uh, just to, you know, raise those individuals to $16. And again, that doesn't take into uh, any compression adjustments above that would have to be made. But that cost, I think, came in around $73,000 to do that. $73,000? Yes, sir. We don't want to stay uh, we hope to have some information um, in time for the budget preparation. Uh, so uh, we're thinking around March or April, just in time for us to uh, include it in the recommended budget for next year. And do you think we have that perhaps time. before the retreat? I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't. Um, it might be necessary to really just to vote a committed the whole meeting just to uh, the results and the recommendations that come back from that study. Keep in mind that that is a study of all positions um, across the city.
The living wage, is, does that include benefits or not? I don't think we took into consideration of benefits. That's just salaries. So if you add another 35% to that number, then that would get you pretty close to the full impact. Thirty percent. Thirty-five. It's generally the number that we use. Yeah. Oh, look. We have asked some other employees to look at it. I hope that we can look at that as well. Is looking at those wages by zip code as well. <coughs> you know, trying to get around to look at if livable wages in those zip codes could explain too why we're getting some of the outcomes we're getting. So we've been trying to track those wages across some forces in our area. Yep. One last slide. Uh, again, we continue to be optimistic about the growth that we've seen. Uh, we do, of course, remain aware that there is always potential for headwinds. Uh, we know that there's been some concern that's been raised with respect to the coronavirus situation in China and other concerns. Uh, but we do see visible growth and development, particularly here in the Rocky Mountain area. We definitely see that from an industrial perspective, a commercial perspective, and a residential perspective. The good news, because we are now to the second quarter, is we are in a position that we can start projecting where we're going to be at the end of the year as well, starting the projecting for fiscal uh, 2020 and 2021. And of course, that's key to our development of the budget and the prepare preparation of the CIP. So we certainly got a lot of information to share with you, along with the information that you've requested tonight. We also have, of course, the ongoing financial updates and information to help build our forecast to where we will, we can be certain about where we will be going into the next fiscal year. Any other questions? Thank you. Our next item is Alexander Evansville Operation Complex Dedication. Mr. Carr. Um, so while Ken's bringing that up, um, what you have before you is uh, just to follow up on the direction we had from um, I think the December meeting. This was brought forward with an interest in um, dedicating the uh, Albemarle uh, Avenue Operations Complex and the Alexander Evans um, Operations Complex. So we took a look at that, um, worked up a couple things. One, which you see right here, is a memorial plaque uh, based on the other ones that we have around the city. Um, this one would actually be placed inside the Environmental Services. We'll recommend to place this inside the Environmental Services Complex over on Fourth Road. Uh, simply because that's inside that area, that's where the sanitation workers now operate out of. Um, so people could come in and see that. Have you, well, typically they, they are inside, but have we ever seen? Yeah, well, so I know we have seen. Yeah, yeah. Turn it, just, uh, the one for this building is inside in the lobby. Miss Gates, oh. it's inside the lobby too, right? Yeah, this is just the brass commemorative plaque, the actual dedication for the. So you get to the next. Wait a minute. Right. We're not going to talk to I didn't know in terms of this about this city building that uh, opposed to the train station is open to the public 24 7. And this would be if someone wanted to read it, uh, knowing that it's very important to the history of Rocky Mountain. But if, wouldn't have access to actually be able to go inside to read it. So yeah. I didn't know if we could be exterior or place it on the outside as opposed to inside. We can, we can do that. Um, but what I would say is what we were envisioning it is in the vestibule. If you've ever been in the complex or the public comes in, they do their business within that vestibule. So we do have public that moves in and out of that building. So it would be when you come in the front door to the right. So you can come in and, and see that right there. I, should, I didn't think to take a picture of it. Okay. I mean, that's that's logical. That makes sense in that end. And also, what's the problem with doing the same thing in the two locations when we do that? The, the well, plaques in both locations. Uh, we, we can certainly take a look at that. Um, simply for this one, we felt like it was more appropriate to do the interior. Um, that was my feeling. Right. Um, 
And the reason I'm saying this too is that part of what we want to do is um, we're also building the, the movement for heritage tourism. Right. And in that particular part of our city, uh, that was a, a hub of civil rights activity and movement. And there could be, I mean, you have the Alexander Evans complex, you have the Buck Leonard House, you got the, the um, Booker T. Washington School in the gym where Martin Luther King spoke, you got the park and that arena. And when people are coming through, they come through and they read, they stop, they look. And so we might want to consider if and that other complex um, on the Albemarle Street side, as uh, Councilman Knight was saying, is that how do we bring, is that I appreciate everything you've done, um, but how do we also bring more information, just like you've done here, to the public and to the employees there as well? Because wherever else we've named a building, it's just really been one place. We've got right. one train station, one city hall, you know. So we haven't had to do a combo in the new world. Right. So I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, and we're actually working on another project where that may dovetail right in. With right. That. So, if you go, King, to the descending map. Uh, well, so this is the, these are the um, mock-ups for the, uh, the actual municipal ID signs, and these are the same thing we're doing at Holly Street Park, City Lake, Lancaster Park, um, four locations that are already on order, um, and we're hoping to get all of those in at the same time. But, so this is what the municipal ID standard sign standard will go that we're moving for all city facilities. Um, so moving down, um, so for the Avenue, Avenue complex, we have recommended placing it at, at this location at Spruce Street, and where there's an existing sign already at Albemarle Avenue. There's two ground sides, two sided ground sides. See them, you'll see them coming both directions. So can you pull back out a little bit? Um, you remember on the wayfind, uh, the wayfinding project that we talked about pedestrian kiosks uh, and the historic walk relative to that. Um, we're actually working on content with that. There's a team together that's trying to work on the content for those signs, what text and photographs and those kind of things. Um, the thing I've asked them to do is there's, I think there's five signs downtown that are already identified in, in the budget. And then to go ahead and start working on the signs, the conceptual plan for the signs for the historic wall. Identify those other locations. So MLK Park, Booker T Theater, uh, I mean, Booker T School. Those multiple things that you just walked through. So we could add a pedestrian kiosk that would be keeping with that walk, that whole thing, to add a section on that on the walking tour. Right, and the trail comes right. Through. So the trail would come right through there. So down Atlantic Avenue, down Albemarle Avenue, there's a site on there with the, um, um, I forget what the name of the house is, it? Or, or, or so, that, um, the community? But Lynn, oh, the uh, Mitchell House. Miss, Miss, yeah. What'd you say? Mitchell House. The Mitchell House, yeah. The Mitchell House that um, Miss Hunter is working on. So, I think the way to address what you're talking about, rather than the plaque is typically for a building that we're doing it there, is to do one of these kiosk panels there and replicate some of the same content and some, some other stuff. That we can put on there. So if I'm that. envisioning what, what the council members is, what the council is asking is that at each location where we have this sign that's standing up, somebody that walks past there should be able to stop and understand who Alexander Evans is. And if you take the information on the plaque and put it in a sort of a kiosk form right there where people can read it, see the information, is that pretty you know, much what you're doing? On the, um, I'm thinking uh, like when you go through Battle Park, you know, mm -hmm. there's some, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know, monuments, what, I don't know what you call yeah, it. Yeah. Markers, okay. Right, markers, right, where you can read information. Correct, I just right. think that, you know, presents a more robust feel for our city. I think that's something we should do. Rocky Mount has so much history from everybody's vantage point. Right, so that's what those pedestrian kiosks are about. One, just orienting you, but also to convey, to tell the story. Um, and there's multiple stories. So there's, 
five or six stories already being planned to work on which sites are working on specifically which ones we want to identify where they need to go and start working on content. Um, so it's a combination staff group and citizens group that we're just getting the ball rolling on that. So my, my suggestion is we have this ready to roll where we can get this done for Public Works Week and that maybe we roll that into the pedestrian kiosk, although we may have to come back and do that some way ahead of time, um, just just to keep the timeline going and get this done. Because we were hoping to put these signs in and the plaque out to do the dedication for public works in the best parents. But that was the suggestion. Mm -hmm. but, well, there's one thing about the sign. Now, this bronze sign, it, it, it can be either interior or exterior. It could. It's a question of where it matters. We have a standard for these, for this historic walk and stuff, for those same signs that would be, so this would be consistent with all the stuff we did in the wayfinding for the entire trail. This one. Mm -hmm. For the, for the blind sign. Okay, okay so, so, so I haven't really seen what that exactly looks like. Okay. So perhaps the thing to do would be to bring that yeah, piece of yeah. it and make sure that we have a consensus on that. Um, I have seen what the sign looks like. And um, to your point, if it's okay with the council to move forward to get the, what we already have the ability mm -hmm. to do right now in time for public works week and then maybe come back and Rededicate so, dedicate so can I ask, may I ask, what is the rationale behind putting it up now, waiting two months? I mean, I mean should we just wait? To That's right. I, I, and the, the historic walk stuff for all the rest of those signs is going to be a much longer timeline. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think in order to make it all work together from the trail standpoint, well, we should kind of maybe look, in, look at it, where all the signs are going to go. And so it works as a system for the walk for that and, and where we put it and what kind of content so it, it has to look in the feel of the other kiosk signs that we're working on. Well see that's that's the issue that I have right. Right. Because I, we haven't seen what that looks like. Right. And, we're and not so, ready for that, so yeah and we don't want to um, there's a lot of good information on, on that track. And so um, to be quite honest I think Maybe the thing to do is to just erect what we can, um, the two pole sign, and then come back. But we certainly don't want to be limited. And I understand the, the need to be consistent so that it looks like a system of signage, but at the same time we don't want to be limited because what has to be said about this may not be needed for some of these other areas and vice versa. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily meaning to suggest that. I'm okay. talking about the look and the feel of the signs and the graphics and those kind of things, um, not not what's on it. Um, yeah, so doing, like, doing it two different times gives you two different opportunities to get a lot of publicity around it. So are we, when we put the sign up, are we going to do something when the sign goes up, or are you just saying you're going to put it up and leave it up and then two months later, we're going to celebrate. Well, because it's going to be longer than two months, I think. You, yeah. you, you make the dedication now for um, both the signs um, on the street as well as the plaque within Environmental Services Building. And then, to your point, when all of these other uh, kiosks are ready, then dedicate them all at one time. Or, or we may do those kiosks in pieces so we could potentially do that phase. Well, we'll be coming to you with that one. So you'll just be coming back to the man or she'll bring back. back. <laughs> well, yeah. my, my, one of my business ventures was signs, and signs take a long time to produce. So, it, you know, if, if this is going to be dedicated, what I read is May, of course, is May what? May, May 17th through 23rd, and I'm not sure how long it would take to get the bronze um, cast, cast because you've got to cast that, and I would imagine it takes a long time to do that. 
Well, the memo said that they wanted to put the signs up next month and dedicate it. Sixty days. It'll take. It'll take sixty days. It'll take sixty days from the time that you all agree on the verbiage and say it's okay that you approve the bronze plaque. And if we order it, it'll take sixty days for it to get back for so them to put up. Late April. And that's okay. The part I was just really the harbor, which I shouldn't have one. <laughs> But I'm just saying I was concerned that you put something up and then you wait two months and get dedicated mm -hmm. or celebrate it rather. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do it all simultaneously. Or yeah, these, these close to the time. Yeah, these two we would do simultaneously and come back. And I was just requesting that if, if even if you haven't done to try to schedule the installation <coughs> closer to the time of dedication. Yeah, that's the, that's the plan. The only one we have to, may have to move forward is the Holly Street Park one because there's some grant stuff. And I was just talking about Alexander. Yes. We Alexander. were trying to do them all as a group for one organization. That's the same. Thank so, you, guys. You got the time uh, yeah. Yes, sir. I think that what we're saying, what you're saying is to go forward with the installation of the sign and the plaque. And then, and, and with the dedication, right, within um, that time period, and then come back to you with what the kiosk type signs are going to be. Then we understand you want the branding to be consistent and right. you want to have a flow mm -hmm. yeah. to it all, yeah. the connectivity. We bring that forward, and when we do that forward, we can talk about scheduling timelines for mm -hmm. Just with the kiosk that you're talking about, I know it's not part of this, but being new, I may have heard it, but I don't recall it. Do you mind just at some point, just a brief paragraph or something, what the concept is? Wayfinding, Sam, yeah, you do. I've seen some of the wayfinding for the event center uh -huh. and stuff. It's a part of the pedestrian trail, um, but yes, we can. I would appreciate that. Just, just, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I can't tell you what you're saying. Okay. You know, I'm assuming we can budgeted in that the vision is right. So we have a little bit of the downtown stuff's already budgeted. It's the next piece we're trying to plan for. Okay. So then we can budget and get a time out. Would that be C I P or is that too small for that? No. Uh, it's a C I P it's a, it's a C I P because it, it tends to be more the way to come in the uh mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. Thank Beautiful you. work. Right. So this time we're going to have closed session, economic development, attorney plan, privilege. Is that you ready? So we're going to ask staff. Uh, oh, we have, a motion. Do we have a motion. So moved. Second. Motion made by uh, Councilman Jordan, second by Councilman Dawson. All in favor, let it be known by both of us. Both names in closed session. We ask our citizens to please exit. February 10th, um, I'll ask the court to provide a roll call. I'm sorry, let's do, uh, let's do a quick prayer. Uh, Councilman Walker, let's start some prayer.
And now item number four is uh, the approval of the minutes of the regular scheduled meeting of the City Council held January 27th, 2020. The recommended action is to approve the minutes. Is there any uh, need for discussion? Do we have a motion? So moved. Yeah. Councilman Daltridge, seconded by Councilman uh, Joyner. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Okay, now we'll have item five, which is our community update, uh, provided by our city manager, Rochelle Smalltalk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of city council, certainly let me begin by saying that I uh, appreciate all the great work of our city council, the assistant city managers, department directors, employees, and staff. A mid-year review is now available on our website at rockymountnc.gov. In it, you will find information and uh, cornerstone achievements from each department over the first six months of this, of this fiscal year. The City of Rocky Mount Parks and Recreation invites you to attend a public meeting concerning proposed renovations at Battle Park. The meetings are February the 20th and 27th. 6 o'clock to 7.30 p.m. and March the 2nd from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. All meetings will be held in the theater lobby at the Imperial Center. For more information, please call 252-972-1151. The City of Rocky Mount's annual International Festival of Culture is hosted by the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission will be held in the Brown Auditorium on the campus of Nash Community College. The free event will take place Saturday, March 2nd, from 12 o'clock p.m. until 4 o'clock p.m. and will showcase a variety of diverse communities that call Rocky Mount home. If you would like to be a vendor and share your culture through food, music, fashion, and more, there is still space available. Please contact the Human Relations Department at 252-972-1181 for more information. As I said before at previous council meetings, over the next several months you will hear me talk a lot about the 2020 Census. Because the Census will determine funding for housing programs, schools, hospitals, economic development, and much more in our community. Approximately $16 million of the city's budget is a result of our population numbers. So this is why our count needs to be accurate and every individual residing in the city is counted. February the 13th at 4 o'clock p.m., there will be a neighborhood president's meeting in the committee room located here on the third floor of City Hall. The Census Representative Bernadette L. Richards, Partnership Specialist for the North Carolina U.S. Census, will provide complete count committee training for the neighborhood presidents and representatives and other community and church representatives. We encourage you to ensure that your household, your neighbor's household, and your community are counted in the 2020 Census. Your confidential data can be submitted online at 2020census.gov. The next update is one that I personally had the opportunity to participate uh, on Friday evening, so I would encourage everyone to go out to the Black Light Project that is now on display at the Imperial Center. The project fe features 14 area black males in picture and narrative form. That the idea of the project is to present black males in a positive manner while shifting the narratives that are often shared through media outlets. The project will also be displayed throughout the city beginning in April via a grant from the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. It really is an exceptional exhibit and I hope that everyone will take the time to go out and uh, see it. A statewide proclamation recognizing the centennial celebration of the Negro National League Week will be held at noon on February 13th at the Imperial Center near the Buck Leonard Exhibition. And then finally, the Human Relations Commission meeting will take place this Wednesday, February 12th, 4 o'clock p.m. in the Conference Room 1, located on the second floor of City Hall. 
For a complete list of upcoming meetings, dates, and locations, please visit our website at rockymountnc.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smoltoni. Uh, this time we'd like to recognize the citizens of the Academy graduates. So somebody from staff can give us a little description of the program and perhaps uh, introduce uh, some of our esteemed graduates. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> and may the Lord bless each one of us. I am Loretta Braswell, and I'm and I am so proud to say 10 of those years I have been coordinating, one of the things I've done is coordinate the Citizens Academy program. And I know. But let me tell you a little bit about the Academy and then I will introduce some of our graduates. The Academy is designed for citizens and employees to learn more about city government and to allow our citizens and employees to become great leaders. And uh, we are so proud to have it, but it's recruitment time, which is why we're here now. Citizen Academy started, of course, in, in 2010, of which I was able to join with two other employees to get the program started. Since then, we've had 10 and 10 citizens that go through the program and to serve, currently serving on boards and commissions. That's wonderful. We've had 15 of our employees to go through this program. We've had over 300 people to go through the Citizens Academy. And we're so happy about that. So we're recruiting now. Uh, we started uh, about two weeks ago taking applications, and we will go through February 18th taking applications. So we want everybody in here to write that date down or put it in on your phone. We also are so happy that we have some of our participants from our last class that will be downstairs. We have plenty of applications, and we certainly would like more people to serve on our boards and commissions. We'd like more people to learn about city government. When I went through it myself in 2010, I was in awe. I was working in the human relations department, but that was the department that I was in. I knew all that we needed to know <coughs> for human relations. I didn't know about finance. I didn't know about producing water at the water plant, which is awesome. Some of the things that the uh, Parks and Recreation Department did, I learned so So I encourage you, those folks that talk about the city that do this, the city that do that, you just don't know. Mm -hmm. And you probably won't know if you don't go through citizens' mm. So I do encourage you to do that. I'm happy to have one of our participants who wants to speak about the pen. She talks about it all. And she even says that every citizen in this city needs to take the citizen's pen. And we can take it. We've got plenty of room. So I'm asking Tanya Parker to come up for a few minutes and then I'll introduce the rest of our participants. Again, my name is Tanya Parker. I live in Ward 1. Um, I have um, been here all my life, and I am a passionate, I love my city of Rakina, and I was very in awe when I went to the um, class on last year. Um, being a person that was raised in Rakina, I didn't know half of the stuff that I learned in regards to the history of Rakina, um, just all the different departments, and it was taken in a time where our city was taught about so much negativity. And I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to go get the information firsthand um, in all the different departments. And so I, I'm super grateful and I compel everyone that has not to go through it. Um, again, it's March 5th through May 7th. It's only one night a week. 
um, from 6 to 9. They feed from 5.30 to 6. Um, and so I promise y'all, if you just move into Rocky Mount, or you have been a resident of Rocky Mount all your life, I promise you, before you post anything on Facebook, or talk about anything that you've seen in the media, or anything, I promise you should go through this class first and learn about everything that's done. And I think you will have an open eye of a lot of things that um, we have seen that may not be true. So I thank you again for the opportunity to be able to see how we uplift the great Ms. Loretta and her making this opportunity for me to speak on behalf of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we start out talking about the history of Rocky Mountain. And most of us don't know our history. So I certainly do encourage you to, um, to come aboard and join us. We work with citizens from 16 to 86. Wonderful age. Those young folk, they get some reports in school about the city, and I love it. So again, I'm encouraging you to be part of the Citizens Academy. And if you will just excuse us now, I apologize. <coughs> we are going downstairs with the applications and wait on you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sorry, this really is the last thing. And the citizens that have been through the Academy met 20 folks last time several of them could not come for various reasons. But if you all would just stand up and introduce yourself. Yeah. We have two city employees in this group. Bill, please call. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Bell. Um, like Mr. Fuletta said, I have to work for the city of Rocky Mountain Energy Resources Department. And the class was an awesome class. Like she said, um, I only knew about energy resources. I got an opportunity to learn about all the different departments in the city right now. It was very wonderful. Hi everyone, my name is Patrice Hale. I also work for the city as a community development planning specialist for the community development department. Um, as we said, I know about my team all my life, but until I went through the program, um, I was able to see my team in real life. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Arthur Green. Um, I'm an entirely a member of the Universal League of Baptist Company. And um, I just like to say that this program has been a bit of a lot for me because uh, we can always stand back and complain about a lot of things, but until you get a chance to actually see some things, um, you know, that, that, that's when you get to learn about the city. So uh, this Citizen Academy has been a great help to me for um, um, contact, um, more really contact with your family, and just, just a lot of areas we uh, learned a lot about the side of the the police department, uh, just a lot of different things, and so it was great. I, I enjoy everything. I'm Adele Green. Uh, I am a volunteer with the Rocky Mountain Community Development Planning and uh, you're well put here in Rocky Mount, so I'm a very conscientious person, wanting to know everything. So you all wrote me and said, make sure Miss Green joined the academy. <laughs> well, guess what? I joined the academy and I have enjoyed myself. I know a lot that I did not know. I said, you might have asked me some questions then. I, <laughs> <laughs> I am Cassandra Green, um, daughter of Cassandra Green, and they pretty much summed it up. Um, I'm Douglas Administrator for Time Out the Church, and I have thoroughly enjoyed um, this academy. I was inducted at first, didn't know what to expect, but um, my mom put me on in, and I was I was ready for that because I learned a lot about the city of Rocky Mountain. I'm Janice Gerald. I've been in Rocky Mountain for about 20 years, and I'm greatly
Well, I want to thank you for your time, your commitment to going through this process, and, and thank you for sharing with us. Can we get a hand? Oh, <laughs> okay, we are the petitions received from the public portion of our uh, meeting. Uh, this is where the petitions from the public of uh, uh, our city council meeting. If you would like to address the council, you will need to sign up. And if you did not get a form to sign up, please raise your hand and someone will bring the form to you. Any comments should be directed to the council as a whole and not to individual council members or city staff. This is your opportunity to raise a question or present a request to the council. However, in most cases, council members will not respond to public comments but may refer the matter to the city manager or staff for follow-up. We ask that you speak from the podium in a civil, non-argumentative, and respectful manner. Personal attacks which have the potential to disrupt the meeting will not be tolerated, and you will be asked to sit down or removed from the meeting. Time will be monitored in order to give everyone an opportunity to speak, and you will have three minutes. If your comments are in regard to an item that is the subject of a public hearing, please wait until then when that item is introduced to speak. Time will also be monitored. If your comments are in regard to an evidentiary hearing, additional time may be granted. So, I would like to ask Dr. Kim McCoon if you come up and uh, state your address, your name for the record, and uh, then we'll hear from you. Dr. Kim McCoon, uh, 220 South Anglewood Drive, Rocky Mountain. Uh, last year, we had a hotly contested municipal election. Citizens of Rocky Mountain were interested in hearing the positions of candidates running either for mayor or ward representation. I belong to the Rocky Mountain Racial Justice Group, which was a member of the coalition that organized the public forum called Who the Candidates. It took place at the Ashcombe County Community College last year, September. If you recall, the auditorium was overflowed. We wanted to hear the positions of, on various problems of concern to our community to all the new candidates who were running. In particular, I was struck by the statement made by the mayoral candidates that crime in this city was the most concerned. Possibly even the number one problem would be capital. Since all of us are not privy to the statistics kept by the police department, some of us, as members of different neighborhood groups, came together to investigate with the police if this was the case. A preliminary conversation with two detectives, a lieutenant and a community service director, seemed to indicate that crime is actually on a downward trend. Just so that everyone can benefit from the information, I'm petitioning that the chief of police be able to speak on this issue, perhaps at our next council meeting. I'm interested especially in the trend in the last 10 to 20 years, breaking down the various categories of crime like homicide, burglary, arson, drug trafficking, vehicular mishaps, etc. This should include the ages of those arrested for particular categories and also by the areas of the city where they are clustered and whether this demeanors follow the same pattern. My intent is for us to understand based on facts and not by innuendos or inferences that our city is crime infested. This tends to instill unsubstantiated fear of certain areas in this city and diminish their values. The facts will also allow council and neighborhoods to take steps to remedy the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, next, I'll ask uh, Mr. Carmen Stancy. <coughs> you please come forward, state your address. on the HRC has been awesome. I'm asking you, the council, to give an update 
on the removal of the Confederate monument at Falls Road ASAP because I put in some time with the relation meeting about the issue. In my closing, it is sad that there are more pressing issues like the audit and other that she should have been more concerned about. I represent families in Rocky Mountain, friends in Rocky Mountain, and even enemies because they benefit also. I have been very effective in the minutes of the meeting. All the meetings I've seen in the video don't lie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dancy. I'd like to ask of Mr. Johnny Cunningham to come forward. uncle was murdered about 10, 13 years, maybe 15 years ago, Xavier Dexter Johnson on Carolina Avenue. 
murder of Saul. His nephew was murdered last year. His cousin murdered of Saul. This family was taking a tragic hit. You know, a couple years ago, I asked why we got, why don't you get more? And we had Marty McCord first name on the list. We skipped all past him. <clears throat> Marty McCord was born and raised out of Rocky Mountain in Little Rock. Why we miss him? I feel like we had Marty McCord with all this stuff going on right now. He's from here. He know what he know what to say. He know what to do. You know, and I was reading some paperwork that the city have put in their rules, regulations that y'all have y'all have the order to have good conduct in the city. Y'all have the right to put that in the city. Gunpowder, firearms, and everything. Y'all have the power to push that issue. It's crime. And y'all have done nothing. These families are more than not killed. Martel Dixon was going down, shot four years ago, titanium on their thing. They just got this shooting three weeks ago. He told the police, his dad told him, told the police, he said, I want my way to do another. These are the type of kids y'all deal with. They ain't playing no games. They hit me on messenger the same way. Boy, you shouldn't be around here. It sounded like they were shooting some, um, some military stuff. And there was, there was people in their apartment on Lenn Avenue. <coughs> it's, it's two blocks away from the big center. You got kids doing AAU basketball, and this stuff happened. You got a lot of kids. I keep telling when y'all gonna protect these kids. When y'all gonna bring the hammer down? Thank you, Ms. Brown. Kaya Darden. Good evening. My name is Kaya Darden. I reside at 1600 Barnum Street, Barnum. Ashland County, Ward 1. Greetings to the city manager, mayor, city councilman, and citizens of Rocky Mountain. I will be using my three minutes to bring a lot of clarity to some very disturbing things that are going on in our city as well as in the media. I will assume that all of us are well aware of the undercover racist group on Facebook portraying to be concerned citizens of Rocky Mountain. Considering the fact that I am a millennial, I spend a lot of time on my social media platforms. I have taken the time to read the comments of the concerned citizens, and I have become physically <coughs> sick to see such disrespect towards our black city leaders. There is an underlying widening divide between different races, which in my opinion has grown significantly since our president was elected. Mm. Not only in our city, but all over this country. If we continue to sit and act as though there isn't, our, our city will result in resegregation, which I am very afraid of. Our ancestors endured so much so that black people could one day become successful and have the opportunity to sit in a leadership position. I read the article about Blanche's Bistro's new development, possibly bringing controversy to the new Main Street reality. First, I want to agree with one of the comments that were made. Pro-black is not anti-white. Come on now. Black business districts exist all over this country. Also, I know you all have heard of Chinatown. I've never read an article about Chinatown causing controversy to nearby business developers. All type of ethnicities are welcome to Chinatown, and there's no sign saying who is and who is not welcome. Oh, Lord. Mm. So with that being said, please lay off of the foolishness and learn how to celebrate one another. Downtown is developing, and I can actually say that I'm pleased to be a part of Rocky Mountain to see the great things that are in store for all people. In closing, I do want to say, for those of you who call yourselves advocating for young people, 
You must first set the example as a leader Come on for young people to want to follow you. As a strong youth advocate, I will tell you that confusion, wrongfully criticizing, and teaching us to disrespect people who you may not agree with, mm. we will not listen nor work with you. As my leader teaches me, respect those of authority, no matter how you feel about them. Thank you. Ms. O'Ree. I know you're not going to smile at me, but that's okay. 
Um, also, um, you know, there are area watches in, in neighborhoods. You know, keep check on your um, you know, neighbors and if there's some weirdo person walking around and talking about um, Why can't we get a um, litter watch so that neighborhoods can kind of come together and catch these bums that keep throwing crap, I mean, uh, litter out on the street? Because I don't live in the neighborhood, but I will patrol my media in front of my shop on 301. <laughs> and I don't know why neighborhood people can't do that. Um, and the next to the last, please just leave that. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Thank you, Okay, that brings us to item 8, which is the consent agenda. Uh, one thing I do need to announce is that we have eliminated, uh, I've eliminated item 15 from the agenda. Uh, it's really more for information. Uh, if you have any interest in serving on a board in the city of Rocky Mountain, if you would let city clerk or someone know, uh, that we can address that. Uh, item 8 is our consent agenda. Uh, A, for consideration of adoption of the following fiscal year 2019 2020 ordinance amendments. The budget ordinance, number one, the electric fund appropriates funds for reimbursement of expenses for mutual aid provided to Elizabeth City in the fall of 2019 relative to Hurricane Dorian. Increases the overtime budget for the current year and offsets mutual aid costs of $24,327. Item two is the trust the canteen fund, the appropriates revenue not derived from city taxes and fees. In other words, vending machines and special programs, $202,720. Uh, item three, grant project ordinance appropriates additional grant funds from the assistance for firefighters, grant to the public safety grants fund, $15,410. Uh, item uh, B, consideration of temporary street closing requests from Ann and Craig, Station Square to close Nash Street, that's the block between Church and Main Street, from 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturday, April 18, 2020, for the Station Square Spring Affair event, the rain date of May 16, 2020. The recommended action is to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by uh, Councilman Knight, seconded by Councilperson Miller. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, all like sign. Motion carries. Item 9 is a public hearing, so we'll now have a public hearing uh, and explanation of the feasibility study relative to annexation number 315 of 2014 Old Mill Road. The, um, yes, the petition certainly meets the standards for annexation. We can go into further detail, but everything is in, in good order. So with that said, is there anybody member from the public who would like to speak to this particular petition? Okay. Um, being none, is there a motion? So moved. Councilman Joyner, is there a second? Second. Uh, Councilman Blackwell, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. All right, carries. Item 10 is consideration of ordinance amending Chapter 10, Article 3, Division 3 of the City Code as follows. Section 1091 removes the following text in subparagraph 4, intended to be occupied for human habitation, whether temporarily or permanently, and Section 1092 replaces Director of Public Works with Director of Development Services. I think some background may be appropriate on that as well. Sure, I think um, it will come forward, but um, as he is coming forward, this is the response to our ability now to um, remove public nuisance from uh, commercial buildings as opposed to now just focusing on residential. Yeah, Council, nothing much to add to that. It's just uh, one, uh, point of clarification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Consistency with the department uh, with us, uh, merging those departments and again allowing us to uh, move forward with that non-residential side. Okay, is there a need for discussion? Ooh. 
Yes, sir. Just a question, yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Mr. Reed, if you would clarify, basically it's just any structure within the city of Rocky Mount is applicable to this, is, is that correct? Any structure, yes, because what we had previously, it was specifically for residential only, so this is going to take that little section out, and then also point of clarity to get public works off of that. Now the Any additional questions? Do we have a motion? So moved. Motion by Councilman Joyner to uh, adopt, second by Council Member Daltridge. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Item 11 is the consideration of the following recommendations from the traffic engineer to adopt a no parking anytime on both sides of Round Tree Drive from Gold Rock Road westward to Hornbeam Drive and B, no parking anytime on both sides of Round Tree Drive from Brentwood Drive eastward for 330 feet. Is there a need for any clarification or discussion? I move approval. A council member uh, Miller uh, makes a motion for approval, second by Blackwell, working hard today. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. And for the record, I'm I'm assured that that may some curve to curb on Roundtree, and that includes no parking in the median, which has been real the real issue on there. Okay, motion carries. Uh, item 12 is direct consideration of municipal agreement with the North Carolina Department of Transportation for reimbursement from the North Carolina DOT relative to curb and gutter replacement at the intersection of Falls Road and Church Street. The city is to be reimbursed up to $25,000. Is there a need for any discussion or clarification on that? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Is that the correct address, by any chance, Falls Road and Church Street? The intersection of Falls Road and Church Street is, uh, is uh, the city manager, perhaps, the project. I'm trying to figure out where they are. Don't you understand where they are? Yeah, Brad. I didn't know they had a second. Oh, I got you. I got all the way through to the end. I'm sorry. Right. I almost thought it ended right at um, Gray Street. Because <laughs> all the way through to the end. Gotcha. And I'll say, I'll approve the motion. Okay, Councilman Blackwell. I'll approve the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman Miller. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? By like sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> Item 13 is consideration of bid for purchase of police vehicles via, via the North Carolina Sheriff's Association Group purchasing program bid number 19 dash. 05-0911 R as follows. A4 2020 Chevrolet Tahoe's Tahoe's 1500 Appalachia vehicles awarded to Park Chevrolet Inc. at cost of $32,435 per vehicle for a total cost of $129,740. And B8 Ford Police Interceptor Utility all-wheel drive, long-leaf pine vehicles, award to Performance Ford, Inc. at a per vehicle cost of $34,349.90 for a total cost of $274,799.20. Is there, a, any, are there any questions? Need for discussion? Motion moved by uh, Councilman Joyner to accept the motion as recommended. Second. Second by Councilman Miller. Miller. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Okay, item 14 is consideration of rescheduling or canceling the March 9th, 2020 um, Committee of the Hall and regular scheduled City Council meeting as it conflicts with the National League of Cities Congressional City Conference. It's moved by uh, Councilman Knight. Well, since it, excuse me, since it says 
Uh, Councilman Knight, you made the motion is that to uh, cancel the meeting. Okay. Councilman Knight uh, has a motion on the floor to cancel the meeting for March 9th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilman uh, Joyner. All in favor, say aye. Walker. I'm sorry, Walker. I'm sorry. I'm... All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Uh, All opposed, like sign. It carries. Uh, item 15, as we noted before, has uh, been removed. Is there any need for new business? All right, that being said, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> so moved by Reverend uh, Kessler Joyner, seconded by Blackwell. All in favor? Aye. Uh, All opposed? <laughs> the meeting is closed. Thank you.